Front left, second row, yes. Um, Frank Mannheim, uh, for the School of Public Policy, or the new name. Uh, I have a suggestion of a, of a very, a major extension of your concept in the path-breaking environmental laws of the early 1970s. The NEPA Act and the Clean Air Act were dramatic extensions of any regulation that we had had before, and they made rapid uh, progress against pollution. But I've written in a book uh, that uh, uh, they also, their provisions created a rift in society uh, that because the laws could not be easily modified or reformed to meet new requirements. So we went from number one environmental country in 1972, and now we're rated 32nd by the Yale Columbia EPI index, Environmental Performance Index. I'll take three questions, then Greg can respond. Second row, one row up, yes. Um, regarding the great moderation, part of uh, what that was about was price stability. And I want to um, ask if that plays into the story, because you talk about derivatives, you talk about lender of last resort. Uh, is price stability just something that happened along with those things, or was, there, was that stability a source of the demand for more financial innovation? John Graham, and then I'll do the side of the room after Greg responds. I'm just wondering, I was very excited by the, nat the Forest Service metaphor, mm -hmm. and um, Mr. Pinchon's words that you quoted uh, w expressed a vanity of you know, human power over the environment, which the Forest Service now repudiates, right? And they don't say, we control fires 100%, we suppress them. Um, similar examples would be, we wanted to exterminate the wolf and the mountain lion, we wanted to let the grizzly bears eat from the garbage pits in Yellowstone. and. Now they, that vanity in natural resource management no longer exists. They're much more laissez-faire, I would say, except when it comes to climate. And I just wonder if, there, if you could extend that metaphor for us with respect to general regulation and financial regulation. Thank you. Greg, responses to any and all? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll respond to the last question first. I have a whole chapter that deals with the uh, fact that people, even when they know that their actions might actually be buying stability for the present but storing up trouble for the future. They don't really know what to do. Uh, so the Forest Service still suppresses more fires than they allow fires to burn because often those fires take place near human habitation and it's not really a choice. So in some sense by allowing people to build their homes and towns right next to the wildland, wildland interface, we put the Forest Service in an untenable position. Something is similar I think happens in the financial sector where you allow the complexity of the institutions to grow that you don't really feel like you have much of a choice. And I, I talk about like uh, Jay Powell actually who's on a governor of the Fed these days gave me a very, I thought, like <coughs> really uh, interesting anecdote about how he was in that position of deciding whether to let Bank of New England's uninsured depositors fail in 1991. And he was in Treasury and they wanted to teach a lesson. They wanted to say, this is moral hazard, we can't let it happen. And the Fed said to them, if you let those uninsured depositors fail, you will have runs on every bank in the United States and Europe on Monday morning. So they bailed them out. So I, uh, is, <coughs> I'm a journalist first, so I talk to people about what it's like, and I don't want to <laughs> presume that sitting in an ivory tower and saying this is what you should do makes it any easier when you actually come to it. Your question on price stability I think is, a, is an excellent one. I talk about that in the book. Um, for those of the 70s and the 80s, inflation, the high and variable rate of inflation was enemy number one. And those who lived through that period just think it was like it caused, it, it didn't just cause bigger and worse business uh, cycles and recessions, but it also actually contributed to the financial problems. So for example, savings and loans had made all these low interest rate loans, but as, as um, inflation went up, so did money market rates, and these uh, institutions lost all their deposits, which led to serious liquidity and insolvency problems. So the belief at the Fed and among many, and economists, was once that you defeated inflation, you defeated the single biggest source of economic instability. What we just discovered though is that once you did that, it brought down interest rates and it encouraged people to take bigger risks. And what we call in financial terms, it brought down risk premia. That caused asset prices to expand. It's one reason why price earnings ratios on the stock market became so much higher in low inflation periods. The problem was is that if your presumption that the world was more a stable place became actually uh, disproven, then the equity price premium would f explode and the price would collapse. So the very belief that by defeating inflation you had brought on stability was the source of its own undoing. 
Are there questions? Oops. Yes. Also brought us sure. closer to the zero. Right, right there. Uh, uh, Bert Ely, a banking consultant. Um, Greg, to what extent uh, in your book do you get into the issue of the distortions caused by tax policy? And I want to cite two specific examples as they relate to uh, the financial system. Number one, uh, the uh, equity capital is much more expensive than debt capital because of the tax treatment of uh, interest on debt versus uh, uh, the payment of, of dividends. The, uh, the other is with regard to home ownership. Uh, you have substantial tax deductions, particularly available to higher income people, both with regard to the interest deduction and the real estate tax deduction, which has an inflating effect on, on house prices. Uh, to what extent, again, coming back to the question, to what extent does your book address not just in those two areas, but elsewhere in the economy, the uh, distorting effects of tax policy on very rational decision making by very sophisticated people. Last question. Yes, in the back. Hi, uh, Ash Navabi. I'm a master's student in economics here at Mason. Um, Mr. Ip, uh, do you talk about in your book um, the effects on uh, of regulation on uh, defamation issues and idea issues, for example, blackmail, um, uh, slander, libel, and how these issues might uh, uh, promote more of these things instead of less. For yeah. example, um, how uh, if you if you have laws against uh, uh, slander, people if uh, uh, if something is published anywhere, people are more likely to believe it because because we have slander laws, it wouldn't be published otherwise. Great response. <laughs> I've never heard that uh, um, problem <laughs> it's not in the book. before, so it's not in the book. But I mean, uh, if I sense what you're saying is that I think it's a classic example of the moral hazard problem. Did those signs that the Fed put in the windows of banks in the 1920s encourage people to like commit their funds to banks that then waste, went and wasted them? And uh, that probably does take place. But it's one reason why, in the presence of deposit insurance, federal regulation of banks also became much tighter in order to prevent, uh, because they understood that because the natural tendency of the depositor to let his guard down needed to be supplanted with federal regulation. I don't talk about tax policy, but I was wondering if you, Jared, yeah, and I, Alex would like I, to I'd love that. to answer that question uh, because uh, it's, it's probably even worse than you said in the sense that um, the effective tax rate on uh, debt financed uh, investment is negative, um, negative 5, 6 percent, whereas on equity it's, uh, you know, it's double digit, 25, 30 percent. So you're abs I, I'm sure uh, we know, it, it, let me put it this way. If, if you arrived uh, uh, from Mars uh, yesterday and I told you what I just said about the relative tax rates of, of debt financing and equity financing for investment, uh, and I asked you, do you think this um, uh, situation would generate leverage problems, uh, you would probably say, of course it would, and in fact, of course it has. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I think the same thing is true about the, the mortgage interest deduction. Just to sum up, Greg's book, Foolproof is indeed literally foolproof. Uh, I picked it up one evening. Greg gave me an advance copy, and I didn't read anything else till I was done reading this, and then I went to bed. So highly recommended. <laughs> and did you sleep soundly, or did you worry? I was a little worried. <laughs> I'd like to thank our panelists and also Greg for coming along. Thank all of you for thank coming you, and the questions. And uh, I know I didn't get to all of you, but uh, Greg and the panelists will still be here just a little. Thank you all. Thanks. Tom.